Hello everyone, this is Marita, one who catches lightning with the Path of Ish podcast, Walking with Our Shadow, where we share ancient indigenous teachings of remembrance, all so we can walk and learn how to walk a path of radical self-love. So it is with uh, gratitude and grace that I get to welcome to the circle someone who <laughs> we have been trying to get into the circle. We attempted an uh, interview earlier uh, last week and it just didn't happen. And so, you know, as all my teachers say and all the elders I have sat with is like when it's hard to get to the prayer, to that ceremony or to that podcast, it's because there's big energy and big medicine that is needed for the collective. And so it seems that we are going to be sitting in that potential, that potential of what a miracle truly looks like. And miracles happen in co-creation. They happen when people come from different ways of being and find a way to build again. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Hillary. Hello, how are you? Oh, I'm finally glad that we're having <laughs> this opportunity. And thank you for your tenacity <laughs> at uh, and making all yeah, right. yeah. Tenacity is an amazing thing. So, Dr. Hillary, why don't you tell us about your creation story now that you've had copious amounts of times to uh, think about it? Not only copious amounts of time, but the first time that I told it, you know, the spirits were like, mm, that's not really the one. And then the second time they're like, yeah, it's not the one either. So then, you know, in the last few days I've said, can you please reveal to me uh, what the correct creation story is for me to be sharing um, during this time? And so this is the one that they told me to share. And it, it came as a surprise to me, mm. but also not um, because it is, I think, how I would define, not think, it is definitely how I would start and how I have started the story of my journey of decolonization. And so this is the creation story. It does not start in a womb. Instead, it starts in a prison. And that prison was the National Boys Detention Center in the Bahamas, where I was working to build a sustainable agriculture training and education program. And the month before I was supposed to do that, unbeknownst to me and my project partner, and also unbeknownst to the general public of the Bahamas, and unbeknownst to even... Um, the majority of the ministries that we were working with, the law was changed and where it had previously been that 16 and 17 year old males who had been arrested and were being imprisoned were sent to the adult prison, um, the adult men's prison would all of a sudden be going to the detention center with the 11 to 15 year olds instead. And in the Bahamas, at the age of 16, you no longer have to go to high school. And so no schooling was provided for the 16 and 17 year olds. And so instead, the 16 and 17 year olds came into the program that I was developing. And as is often the case, I, I was supposed to be there for four months. We were building a large aquaponic system and an extremely large greenhouse. And we were supposed to leave on May 1st of 2010 and our materials arrived on May 4th of 2010. So my project partner was unable to continue on and I had to make a decision about whether or not I was going to continue and um, keep my agreement. And so I did because I'm definitely a, I said I was going to do it. So I'm going to do it kind of person. And so for the next several months, I mean, really for the next year, year and a half, I worked with the 
young men, uh, particularly the 16 and 17 year olds um, at this detention center. And it was, um, I think, more of a different experience for them working with me than it maybe was for me working with them. I was not from any kind of demographic that most of them would have encountered in their life on in many ways, shapes, and forms. And it was absolutely a challenge for me. And I absolutely had to become a very different person. And so it was just me. There was no security, no guards, no officers, no other uh, supervision besides me. And we were clearing out several acres um, in order to build this greenhouse. And we did it all by hand. So I was out there, you know, with 30 16 and 17 year old boys who had been arrested and were incarcerated with machetes. And we were just out there cutting through the bush because in the Bahamas, you know, it's not like these lovely grassy, you know, glens. It's bush. It's tough bush. It's very sinewy um, branches and vines. And in August of that year, and it was the first week of August, because I always remember it was the week of Emancipation Day in the Bahamas, which is August 6th. There was a group of missionaries from Long Island, New York, coming to the detention center. And they were doing all of this programming for the week. And so I felt I had I talked with them a little bit and um, they seemed like lovely people. And also I felt that there was probably some slight differences in how they were approaching things from how I would necessarily approach things. But I also felt that particularly given the overall situation in the detention center and given that it is a detention center, that as many individuals that the residents could encounter and experience and as many different experiences that they could have, the better, because there weren't a lot of opportunities and experiences for them to have. So that seemed important to me. And I remember them saying to me, you know, don't you want to sit, stay because, you know, these are some people that are like you, they're from where you're from. Um, and don't you want to spend time with them? And I said, you know, I think it will probably be a better experience for everybody if, you know, I allow them to do their part and I will, uh, remove myself from the situation. And I took a week off, which was also great for me. So, um, took the week off. I went back the week later and first thing we did, we, everyone sat down. I sat them down. I asked how was their week. They talked about the different activities they had done and then they got really quiet, you know, and this is not particularly necessarily a quiet group of individuals, you know, um, lot, lot, lot to say, um, you know, teenage boys. So they got real quiet and I kind of looked at them and they started to get this really serious look on their faces and, and even this kind of confused look. And there was this one, this one kid who was kind of, kind of the ringleader, you know, and he was like, you know, Miss Booker, it was a little weird. It was a little strange. I was like, oh, okay. Why was it weird? And, and, you know, they said, and they all have this like really confused look on their face. And there's probably, you know, about 10 of them because there were really about 10 of them that worked with me very regularly. And he said they were all kind of talking. And what they said was, you know, they tried to talk to these people and the people couldn't understand what they were saying. And the people talked to them and they also couldn't really understand what they were saying. And it wasn't just accents and it wasn't just words, but, you know, there are all of these different phrases and there was just on so many levels, you know, there was this trans that there was, you know, a lack of translation. There was a loss in translation. And then they just stopped and they said, what we realized is that 
you're not one of them. You're actually more like one of us. And in that moment, I mean, they were confused. And I was really surprised to hear them say that. But something happened in that moment where our dynamic completely changed after that. You know, again, teenage boys, teenage boys who are incarcerated. But there was a certain... I always had had their respect because I worked really hard. But there was a different understanding after that. And there wasn't just a different understanding for them because they had gained this different perspective. There was also a different understanding for me in terms of how I was perceived in that particular environment. And then in a way that story repeated itself so many times in so many diff other situations but that was a really important one because working in that environment really um, expedited the extent to which I came to understand not only that, partic that particular cultural context, which became extremely important to me for so many reasons and is still extremely important to me for so many reasons and such a part of who I am, but it also taught me a whole lot about colonialism and a whole lot about uh, the subtleties and the complexities of both colonialism and decolonization. And it most importantly was probably the first time in my life where I really, really questioned my positionality in the world. You know, that experience for me was a real leveling that I'm not sure that I had ever experienced in such a real or visceral way. So I would say that that is... Well, I will say that's how I was called to. That was a creation story I was called to share today. You know, it's such a powerful story. And I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, asked. <laughs> we always think what we should be saying <laughs> or how we should present ourselves. But for someone like yourself who walks the deep medicine path, it's always good to remember that there is a reason for that, right? And so I'm thinking the ancestors and everyone who, who guided you because, you know, I, I feel that, that that story has so much to it. You know, it talks about access. It talks about vulnerability. Uh, it talks about truly, you know, colonization being so subtle that you don't understand each other, right? Like literally the language, right. you know, Literally. And, and also this is a situation where everyone speaks English, yeah. right? And, um, you know, all, all of the, the young men that I worked with would speak in dialect and I would speak in dialect too. But, you know, as is true in most of the Commonwealth Caribbean, most everyone knows how to speak Queen's English too, you know? So there was such a, loss in translation was is surprising even even you know among individuals who are from you know extremely underprivileged or underserved communities because also you know Nassau is on an island that's tiny you know so it's only 21 miles by seven miles so everyone lives pretty close to each other mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's almost like, you know, the translation was lost in the mission, you know? Yes. And Absolutely. so I'd love to kind of delve into that, you know, and the reason I think this is such a complex topic. I, I see like at least two or three episodes that we could do on this. Um, 
because so many people, right, believe, right, that we have these common grounds or that we these common languages and that we mean the same. And they get really upset when you are curious or really upset. Yes. <laughs> like, why don't you just understand me? And I'm like, you might have said red. What does that mean to you? Because I think of red and I, you know, I come from painting. So my, I, I, red's going to be a lot of things, is it, you know, and I, I find, I'm curious why you believe there's this kind of pushback when people are asked just to even clarify what they mean. And I have my insights, but I would love yours because I think that's the beginning of where we have to start this conversation. We've already shown through your amazing story how we don't understand each other. Yet there is always this rush to, I get it, I get it, or I get you, or I see that, or I see the vision, I see this. And I find it more and more, like every time I talk to people, I'm like, you you just don't get it. Like you, you don't, and that's fine. And I don't have the time or the energy to walk you over this bridge right now, you know? And so let's talk about that bridge. But before we even get to the concept of a bridge, what is it about people? And I find this more so in... I don't I even know if it's modern culture or if it's the speed that we're living things. Why aren't we curious to just ask people to clarify things? I mean, I think it's a great question because as you know, I don't have a problem yes. asking clarifying I, 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think, I think there's a lot of, man, I could give so many different answers, but I think, Part of it does have to do with speed. I think that part of it has to do with people's lack of understanding of how many definitions a single word has or can have. I mean, you know, even as an interdisciplinarian, right? And just, we're just talking about the academic world. If we look at just the academic world and I, you know, cross many different disciplines and I will use a word and I will spend forever defining that word because if I look at 10 disciplines, they all use the same word, but they define it differently. And I think that part of the, maybe the first answer that I would give besides time is that in reality, most people are not exposed to enough different perspectives truly to understand how differently, you know, different people might define a specific term. And, um, you know, there's, everyone wants to talk about diversity and everyone wants to talk about inclusion and, you know, DEI and everyone wants a DEI director and all of these other things, but implicit in this country, especially in the U S implicit in almost every conversation about diversity is how we can all be assimilated. Mm. Like yes. actually, how can we all be the same? So, you know, and I, and I, one of my favorite story, I mean, it's a story. It's not one story, but one of my favorite things to talk about is, you know, if there's a particular group or organization or whatever it might be, and they want to talk about how diverse and inclusive they are, the way that they go about doing that is showing a picture of their staff. That's like all different shapes, sizes, and mm. colors. Um, and yet everyone is expected to, you know, act a particular way and leave particular things. And so there's this idea that ultimately, you know, this it's like the idea of the melting pot. Ultimately, everyone needs to somehow melt into this common flavor, you know, rather than recognizing that real diversity is like a party in your mouth with all the flavors. <laughs> um, and I think, you know, I, I like to use food as mm -hmm. metaphor. Um, but 
I think I think that's one of the biggest thing that most people haven't been exposed to that much diversity. Again, especially in this country, where we're all still pretty divided um, and pretty separated in a lot of ways. And also, you know, maybe in a workplace, there's, you know, everyone kind of does their thing. But a lot of times, you know, then everyone goes home and their lives are so different Mm -hmm. at home, you know, or who they are. The languages they speak, all of that, you know, is so different. And so I think that's part of it. I think there's also a lot of fear. I mean, I think so much of it is fear. And so much of it is impatience too. people. It's not just the time, the amount of time, but, you know, relationship building doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And really what we're talking about is relationship building and, um, and common understandings and, and also allowing for, and this is one of my most favorite concepts from Caribbean literature and Caribbean political philosophy is this idea that there are some things that we're just never going to understand and that's okay. And it doesn't mean not to try to, but to, but that you can appreciate someone or you can appreciate a group of people or you can appreciate a place, even if you don't understand everything because newsflash it's impossible to understand every single aspect or see every single aspect. But then the final piece I would say is also connected to that, that most people lack the capacity to even see the varieties of their own, their own diversity, their own internal diversity enough to recognize how differently again one word can can show up and that's i think one of the reasons one of the things that the story that i shared illuminated i mean that experience illuminated for me a a a way of being a way that i showed up that i had never shown up before in my whole life because i had never been put in a position to me to show up in the ways that i did um and that's my privilege. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I, it's funny that we're talking about this because I also, you know, all the time for, for instance, on Instagram, don't you want to um, be an ambassador for our sustainable ethical jewelry brands? And it's me. So my first question, I mean, most of the time I just ignore it, but every once in a while I'm like, in a mood. And so I'm like, so what do you mean by sustainable and ethical? What makes your brand sustainable and ethical? And of course, no one can even answer the question. But yeah, I mean, these are questions. Again, everyone wants to be able to put the check mark. Because that's part of what's expected in late stage capitalism is that there's some level of humanism and environmental consideration. But most people can't even define the terms or answer the questions. So that's where I would start. (laughs) You know, one of the things that kind of came to mind as you were, as you were talking was, you know, I, I grew up in a melt, I didn't grow up in a melting pot. I grew up in the salad bowl version of it, you know, and, the outside though my the world that i had to interact was the melting pot right so i came in and out you know Mm -hmm. uh you know dressing Mm -hmm. on the side uh what you could say but right you know this idea of sameness right which i just you know and Mm -hmm. i almost feel like um you know i've been i watch a lot of uh foreign films and things like that you know for a lot of reasons and i've been recently watching Australian and British mystery. They're like my favorite shows to watch. And one of the reasons that I appreciate, you know, the Australian or the British mystery shows is that the characters, when they are showing, you know, the diversity, isn't like they were, they were trying to 
to fit. Oh, we need this person in here. We need this color. We need this, you know. And when you see them go home, their home life, they don't change as much, you know, you know yeah. colony, which belongs to England. But you have a, yes, amazing, you know, amazingly good at colonizers, these, you know, uh, Europeans were. But at the same time, because there was, there's so much in the pot, the ingredients are going to pop. They're not going to all be the same. You can't amalgamate so much. And when I look at U.S. shows, right, um, that even they're using, trying to use characters as window dressings, but the characters are the same. They speak the same as if you would put yep. a white person, even though you're putting them as now, you know, Latinx, yep. right? And I'm watching the shows and I'm like, yep what cultural person did you talk to? We don't talk like this. <laughs> you know, or may, there might be small yep. inflections, but it's li li literally just the same script and changing the color of the people. And once in a while throwing in a, you know, in this term, a salsa or something like that. And so it's, it's right. Or one, Sp yeah, one Spanish, yeah, one word. Spanish word, right. Or, or they're, you know, they're very emotional people. And so, you know, you get emotional, you know, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But so it's it's almost like, you know, in the in the creation of these states which are supposedly united, which we know that are divided, and this creation of a homogenous culture, you know, we there really isn't room for people who are in a spiritual awakening to really awaken unless they really do the work of decolonization. Would I be correct in, in this kind of like train of thought I'm on? I mean, I agree. It, it's interesting because I was thinking a little bit earlier um, that for me, you know, I said this is the story, the kind of the creation story of my journey of decolonization. There's never been a point for me where, you know, regardless of what my journey looks like, however it might define whether it's you know a healing journey or and, and so there's all these different terms that people use like like journey of consciousness journey of awakening healing journeys all of these things and and i might at times use those terms but for me just because of all of the aspects of my story and my commitments and you know long before that moment there's never been a time when it hasn't been a, a journey of decolonization. And I think that it's important to stipulate that and to specify that because you can be on a healing journey and it cannot be a journey of decolonization. You can be in an awakening, whatever. I mean, maybe not legitimately, but, you know... It, there's all of these kind of new age ideas or whatever about, you know, a lot of those terms are used to talk about an individual's journey or an individual's path. And to me, colonialism is a collective trauma, you know, over many generations. And one cannot separate oneself and one's own journey from the journeys of every single other being an entity that has been affected by colonialism. And I think there's, you know, an infinite number of, uh, to pathologize colonialism, there's an infinite number of symptoms and an infinite number of treatments, but all of the treatments are relationships and, uh, there's no, you know, there's no five steps to decolonizing yourself. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, it, it is a whole journey and a whole path and it takes an entire lifetime and probably many, many lifetimes. So yes, I, I think that it is difficult to truly be in a in a healing to truly heal and to truly I mean I don't know I don't know how to set I don't know how to separate it but I when I hear people talk about it and this gets back to what do you mean 
when I hear other people kind of talk about their journeys, they don't talk about it in the same way that I do. And one of the conclusions that I have come to is that it's because so many people separate their journeys from the journeys of every single of, of everybody else. You know, like it's an individual thing. Since uh, 2006, my email signature has been this quote from the Australian Aboriginal movement, which is, um, if you've come here to help me, you're wasting your time. If you've come here because your liberation is bound up in mind, then let us walk together. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, for me, such a defining concept of how I move and how I understand decolonization. But also, at the same time, like I said, there's an infinite number of ways that colonialism shows up and an infinite number of ways of decolonizing. And it's, I have learned, extremely contextual. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also very much related to the ways that people's environments, and those can be cultural environments or social environments, but very, very much ecological environments, how those form the contexts through which people understand relationships and relationship as healing and what it means to be to be free in this world and what it means to be free in this life. Wow, a lot there to unpack. And one of the things that I'd like to, as we follow this river of conversation, is to kind of, you know, as we bring that image of water and rivers flowing, right, is when people are stepping into, right, a non-individual journey and they're starting to process or be curious about the journey of a collective that is not including just humans right and as they step with that curiosity into other cultural circles such as the indigenous circles here. I feel that one of the central, I'm going to talk about it in a different way, is that relationship or being driven or making decisions or that, you know, for me, it's just like that guiding light, you know, to be something that's not human based. And I feel that that's a challenge and I'll, I'll just put it into context. You know, when, whenever I create things, it's not being inspired by the environment that I live in and not just concepts, but what the trees eat. Many people outside of an indigenous culture live that way. And I think it's really hard for people um, to see that. You know, if you go on my Instagram, right, if you go onto my business pages, you probably don't know because they look normal that prayer and ceremony is done or requests or permissions are asked at all times from the earth and from the environment I live in to co-create, you know, even if I put a picture of a tree, it is because it has asked to be there or that it will hold that imagery. And those are the fine tuned details and the nuances that many people, you know, are not curious about because it looks normal. And so they are invited by it because it looks similar but yet they step in and aren't curious about what really holds everything. 
everyone, and then they take their time, but I don't think, and I don't believe, and I don't think we share about this all the time because it's just how we live. The true difference, cultural differences in this case that we're only talking about are indigenous teaching circles. And so I kind of would love your, you know, as someone you have been in and out of them and you are, as I would agree, more like us. How can you explain that journey or that change, (laughs) right? When you leave a human centric version of being to literally being like, oh, I, you know, for example, you know, what's my new cacao receta that I'm going to do? I'm not going to do it out of my imagination. It's the recipes handed down to me. It's what the Aina is asking for me. I talk to trees and plants and I talk to what will be supported versus, oh, I like this. I, I, this makes me feel yummy. I don't do that. And that is what is how to listen to their voices. And you hear it and you see it in a lot of healing circles, which I think is important. But then how, how can we, the language sounds similar, right? You know, radical self-love. Yeah. But it's so nuanced and so culturally different that people just have culture shock sometimes. So I'd love for you, there's my long runabout question or topic um, and just would love your kind of uh, input and, and vision and, and uh, collective curiosity into that. Um, well, one thing is, you know, getting back to... I mean, it's such a great question. I mean, something that I definitely consider so frequently when I hear, for example, this was one that really hit me recently when I was witnessing a conversation about what are the most intelligent animals. And I just thought, what does that, what are you saying? Which animals possess the capacities that are most similar to humans? Is that the question? Is that what we're actually talking about? And in a way, I think that gets back to people's inability to understand that the world might be different, that anything in the world could be different than they are. (laughs) Um, And that you know, what is actual difference? What is actual diversity? And colonialism, of course, teaches us that there are certain qualities and characteristics that are superior and certain qualities and characteristics that are inferior. Um, And it's very important if you want to be valuable in this colonial capitalist system to possess the qualities and characteristics that are considered superior. And this just constant, and sometimes it's more subtle than others, play between domination and subordination. Like to me, it comes back to that so frequently. That and that people place their worth in being considered superior and being considered dominant. And I think that frequently, I mean, certainly people who I know, and you know, it's at the very beginning when you were talking about the miracle, it's a miracle that I am who I am. There is literally no reason, no rational reason that I should have lived the life that I've lived because, you know, I'm like a white woman from Delaware, you know, (laughs) um, (laughs) like literally. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, and there's, you know, that I have lived the life and that I, that I've lived and that I've, you know, see the world that I see it is, I mean, I just live in complete gratitude because obviously there's, you know, 
that's part of the reason why I can only be, you know, like, I can't believe that there's not more that's been moving me and pushing me and shaking me for my whole life. <laughs> um, so, you know, I know a lot of like pretty, you're like real average white Americans I know a lot of those people. And again, a lot of people can't even see themselves. And so many people are grasping for a sense of worth and don't know where to find it. And honestly, so many people have, I don't think ever truly felt love mm. or loved because so much of their lives and their worth revolves around individual achievement rather than the wealth that comes from connection and community and relationships. And uh, I think I said this one time to you, like the relief that comes from knowing that you are not responsible for doing everything yourself. You are not respond. You can't do everything yourself. And yeah, I mean, it's a complex question because there's just so much disconnection between, and, and it's just disconnection. To me, one of the definitions for me of colonialism is separation and disconnection, it's division, right? And so there's this other part that has to do with humans separating them, this idea that humans are somehow separate from quote unquote nature rather than animals that live in ecosystems and are part of ecosystems. Um, and that definitely plays into it. But I think, I think the worth piece is really huge because I think to a certain extent, a lot of people see, you know, again, ecosystems as disposable, you know, or at least as resources, right? Even people who love to be out in, again, out in nature, right? Oh, to connect with nature. It's like, I hate to break it to you, but you're like always connected to nature. You, you can't disconnect yourself from, I mean, in real life. That's one of the reasons why food has been so central to everything that I do because I'm like, do you realize <laughs> that you would die if it weren't for all of these ecological processes and all of these different ecosystems and all of these individuals and all of these plants and all of these animals. And I think that one of the primary things that, and this is the last point I'll make, but one of the primary things that keeps people from being able to move out of a human centric space is because if they are just quote unquote nature, then again, what is their value? Like mm -hmm. aren't, aren't we supposed to be the superior species, mm -hmm. you know, and if we're not that, then, you know, then we are also disposable. And in a colonial system, you know, humans absolutely are considered disposable. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, the in again, getting back to the food industry is just, we are, so many people are able to eat because of so much slave labor in the food industry. Continued, yeah. 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 In real life, all the time. Um, in this country, as well as elsewhere. Um, I don't, one of the things that I've found interesting, you've probably seen it, you know, is there's now this crisis in Florida. <laughs> there's no, there's no one to, to do any of the harvesting of the, the, the food because 
immigrants aren't allowed to be there. You know, and I think most people don't understand how much migrant labor is actually slave labor because people are not being paid enough mm. to even survive. Yeah, we um we came to this country. Uh, uh, my dad worked a lot with uh, migrants, and we'd go out to the fields and and be with them, and went to a lot of prisons as well as a child. My mom didn't know about it, by the way. But uh, <laughs> she's like, "You went where?" I was like, "I got a hamburger." He's like, "Shut up! Don't say anything." Anyways, um, <laughs> to do this work, you know, and um, right, you know, something that I think these stories that are have comes to mind. You know, I recently uh, got a text from a friend of mine here, a farmer as well on the island, and just talking about what it's like to be on an island. And I know you've worked with islands in your first story. You know, so we'll probably end end on island talk since, since they seem to really want to be present here. And my experience of, of, of being here, of living on islands, of working with land, is that it's so central to how you build relationship. And a lot of their comment was, ah, uh, you know, there was, he knew of people who were trying to buy the land next to him and, and, uh, they were, you know, people from, you know, the continent, you know, or the mainland, you know, and right. Right. they were just, you know, asking all these questions and asking him about all these questions. And he's like, you just don't get it. Like you, you have to work. The, it's the land first. All of these questions that you're asking is like, it's like you can't answer it, right? And a lot of people here is like, you know, do everything cash. They don't really keep books. And and he was like, yeah, because the land will tell me what to do. And the land will give me the vision instead of like coming in and being like, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to create. This is where it should be created. And I mean, there's enough bureaucracy to get anything built here. But he was just like, it's not going to work. If you come in with that attitude, it's not going to work because you're coming yeah. in with a culture of I get to do this, I want this, this is my vision, me, 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 right? I need, you know, assets or visions or, or numbers and this and the island's like, no, <laughs> bro. No. Right. It's not about you. Right. This is me. You are on my land that I created, says Pele, right? And so, right. you know, it's, that cultural shift is so important. And I'd love for you to kind of elaborate on that since you have had, um, you know, lived on islands and, and, and you work very deeply with land of like, how can people like visually or have that example in their life as a way to kind of start to understand how different uh, cultures live? Yeah. I mean, I think one point, and I actually did make, mean to make this point, um, as part of my answer to the last question is I think that it always boggles my mind that people don't understand the value of just asking that in and of itself, you know, which is also how we started when I said, you know, I had to, I had to ask what was the right story, you know, and the thing about land is, you know, lands are ecological entities and they have their own personalities and they can't be controlled, you know, they're going to do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is... Man, I am definitely somebody who thinks that everybody should have to spend a certain period of time producing food in some way, shape, or form because when you grow plants or you raise animals, you really realize how little control you actually have. Yep. <laughs> I mean, at all. Yep. Um, but including over 
the thing that sustains you and allows you to stay alive. I'm like, I don't know how you can be, you know, an atheist farmer. I, I don't think I've met one, to be honest, um, because you're relying on entities over which you have no control. So it is like the only that has to be a relationship. And I think islands are unique. I 100 I love islands so much, right? I just, yeah, couldn't even begin to talk about how unique and special islands are. Um, and, and in my academic realm, it's, you know, there's this idea of archipelagic consciousness. Mm. Um, yes, which we can talk about another time. <laughs> Um, next show. One of my favorite things. <laughs> next show. <laughs> yes. Next. Next podcast. Um, with this idea of archipelagic consciousness, which is also, um, and particularly in, in the Caribbean context, about fragment and fragmentation and mosaic, you know, and, and about the relationship between all of there's so many different conversations that are happening at one time and just understanding how to navigate all of those different conversations. But I think, yeah, just this idea that, you know, you can ask somebody, it, it, I mean, it kind of gets back to conversations around like permission and consent, just like basic it not this basic manners. Like I always think that it's kind of like basic manners. You have to ask about something. Um, if, if, if you're interested in something you have to ask, but I do think that islands are particularly temperamental and particularly, <laughs> I mean, truly, um, and in a way need to be right. It is different to serve. It is a different kind of survival, right? And it's also a different kind of relationship. Like the people you live with on an island, you have, there's just completely different relationships with those people than continental relationships. And that, that's one of the things that I struggle with most living on a continent is that the depth of the relationship, the understanding that everyone is needed in order to survive is not present. Um, and that's the interesting thing is that's true more so regardless of socioeconomic differences than it is continentally in my experience. Because like everyone's got to survive and everyone has to figure out how to get along. And again, especially in the case of living in a 82 square mile Island with 300,000 people, it's not, not a lot of space. And so it comes back to the There's a vulnerability about it. And you can't ignore it. I mean, honestly, you're always vulnerable. But in some, like in this country, in the U.S., it's easy for a lot of people to, again, particularly like people who I grew up around um, or people who I'm currently living around who have never had the experience of realizing how vulnerable and close to death they really are. And I think that there are probably certain things that only experience can offer. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not always sure. So I guess that's the way of saying, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question because. I think you did though. I think you did. And, you know, as we round the Island with this is, you're talking about relationship, which is what we're talking about. And I think islands yes. teach you how important relationships are and also how 
almost valuable you are in that and how also how much of an impact you can create. And I think yes. people don't understand that, like the impact if I decide to, you know, you know, knock down some trees could be huge to myself because I don't like them. I'm not going to do that, of course. I could impact my neighbor, right? Because all of a sudden this wind tunnel then means all the seeds and the spores are going to plant on whatever they were doing. And then I just trashed whatever they were trying to do. And people don't understand that, right? And so what I find fascinating about this conversation as we're coming to a close is people are looking for a relationship. They want to mean something in that relationship, yet they're not willing to really accept the vulnerability of what possibility means and that potential of true relationship is to have accountability, you know, true accountability right. and to understand we all impact each other. Yes. So Hillary, thank you so much. You have definitely impacted me and um, super excited about the projects that you and I are working on. Hush, hush, soon to come, everyone. Get really excited. And if you're not <laughs> following Dr. Hillary, uh, where can they follow you? They can follow me on Instagram at Dr. Hillary Booker and also Earthy Empress Wellness. And also find me um, at my website, which is drhillarybooker.com. Beautiful. Thank you. And I highly recommend Dr. Hillary. I usually highly recommend people who are on my podcast because I'm picky. Well, that's okay. <laughs> so thank you to your people and your ancestors. Uh, it, it was the conversation that had to be. I don't think we would have had this conversation the other day. So I'm no, we wouldn't grateful have. that we listen to the wind and chaos and everything going on and the, <laughs> the brush fires happening here uh, right now. So thank you for your time, Dr. Hillary. Many blessings to you and all of your endeavors. Thank you. You as well. Always a pleasure. Yes, and we will meet again for a next conversation. I see many in our future. Me too. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Once again, it is with deepest gratitude that I bow to you for joining me on this podcast, this episode, this circle, this Latica, this meditation, this remembering. I hope that you have stayed curious. I hope to see you in the circle again next week. So make sure that you like or follow. Until then, may you be blessed with abundance of peace and radical self-love.